Now, really, why did I think that was going to work? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm on the Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build this week, and I'm gonna do the outer crown sheet and throat plate assembly. This is basically the entire outer structure of the rear section of the boiler. It's a big job, and we're gonna do it all right now. Here's where we left off. The main boiler shell there is complete. Next, we need to add the outer crown sheet and throat plate assembly to the back of it. That's kind of this area here of the boiler. It encloses the firebox and will essentially complete the outer surface of the boiler. So it's a pretty big milestone. To begin with, I need to make kind of a strip that attaches the shell to the outer crown sheet. And it needs to fit around the throat plate here in a very specific way, as you'll see here in a moment. You can kind of see how this is all going to go here. Unfortunately, the drawing does not have the length for this strip, which would have been very, very helpful. So I'm going to have to do my best to estimate how big it needs to be. Using a seamstress tape here, I can kind of get a sense of how long it should be. There needs to be a gap above the throat plate on either side of this strip. With that measurement in hand, I can go over to my big pieces of copper here and mark out this piece here to cut it out. As always with these copper pieces, I'm laying it out a bit oversized and I'll mill it down to final dimension to make sure everything is accurate and that I have nice edges on everything. Over to the bandsaw then to rough cut this. And now I can set it up in the milling machine using my sheet metal clamping system that I made in a previous video in this series. It has proven very useful on all these boiler parts. Got a thin parallel down there to act as reference. And then I'll put the copper strip in here. And to get better clamping force on that piece, I'm going to put some little pieces of similarly sized material at the bottom edges of the clamp. Same as you would with like the heel on a toe clamp. Tappy tap tap and away we go, machining this flat. As always with these pieces, I just pick whichever saw cut is the least terrible and put that down on the parallel to begin with, then clean up one edge, and then flip it over and machine the other edge parallel and down to dimension. Then I square up the ends with a little bit of side milling and bring it down to length. Next, I decided to put center lines both ways on this strip. With these boiler parts, I've learned it's extremely valuable to have both center lines on every single piece. It's amazing how often that has helped me align things and has saved me from myself when I wasn't sure how something was supposed to go together. I generally scribe these pretty deep so that they will survive hammer forming and pickling and the other tortures that we're going to put it through. To create the curve then, I decided to hammer form it. I could have used my slip roll, but since it needs to be curved right to the edges, I figured hammer forming would be easier. And the radius happens to be the same as the front tube sheet, so I just used the front tube sheet former. I put a screw in the edge of it here with a little piece of the scrap material behind the screw to again balance the clamping just like you would with a toe clamp. And then I hammered the annealed piece around the form. Fancy sheet metal tools are great, but never underestimate the power of hammer forming, especially with copper where once you've annealed it, it's just so easy to form with hammers and other simple methods. There's my little arch. Shape-wise, it's looking very good. Let's see how it fits here. The crossways center line gets it centered on the boiler shell because remember I have a center line there as well. And then the longitudinal center line allows me to get the strip exactly halfway into the shell. So those center lines are already proving their worth. But here's where things got a little weird. I put the throw plate in there and I didn't have the gaps that I expected to, even though I had measured that so carefully. After putting some thought into it, I realized how this went wrong. I was measuring the outside of the boiler shell which is two material thicknesses away from the actual radius that needs to be measured here. And it doesn't seem like much, but this is fairly thick material, and those two thicknesses threw off the measurement enough to where this thing was quite a bit too long. Well, now I had the unenviable task of trying to shorten this piece after it's already been curved. I attempted this setup in the mill, which failed horribly because, of course, this copper is annealed and very soft, so the end mill just kind of deformed it when it touched the material there. That was no good. Then I tried this setup here, and this worked okay as long as I took light cuts and kept the material very close to the top of the vise jaw there. And I was careful to remove the same amount off both ends so that the center line that I've scribed would remain valid. You might be asking yourself, why did I do a fussy mill setup there instead of, say, sawing and filing the extra material off the ends? Well, it's for the very important reason that shut up, that's why. Now, however, I have the gaps above the throat plate edges there, as you can see. The reasons for this are a bit obscure, and I'm not entirely sure I agree with this aspect of Kozo's design, but you'll see how it all fits together here in the end. 
But with this piece basically done now, I can clamp it in place and I need to get this riveted onto the boiler shell. This is one of those annoying joints that's riveted and soldered. Over on the mill, I've got a fairly simple setup for this. I'm just using my vise as kind of a giant V-block there. It's not clamping the shell, just holding it. And I'm going to get it centered under the spindle using the balancing a scale trick. I've upgraded this trick to use my spring-loaded tap follower so I can do it without needing three hands. This is a trick I got from a viewer. Works extremely well. Once that scale is level, then we are centered under the spindle. I can zero my y-axis there. To keep the boiler from moving laterally here, I'm putting an angle plate on the back of it, up against the edge of the shell there. Remember, the vise is not clamping the part. The vise jaws are too short for that, and I would risk squishing the shell because it's fairly soft from all of the heating that it's had. Then on the other side, I just use the front nose there of a toe clamp to hold the front edge in place. So there's things holding it left and right, basically, so it can't move. Then I throw the edge finder in there and I'm going to find the edge of that shell so that I can translate over a very specific amount to make sure that my rivets end up centered on half of the rivet strip there. Now I can rotate the shell around to get the rivet where I want it. There's no specific measurements for these in the drawings. It's just kind of eyeballing them into four decent places. And to keep the shell from rotating during this drilling, I'm just putting my hand on it. There aren't really a lot of forces trying to rotate the shell here. After spotting that, I then drill carefully through both pieces of material here with the clearance drill size for the rivets that I'm using. These are tiny little copper rivets. And I put a rivet in there temporarily just to hold everything in place while I move around and do the other three. So there's four little rivets that hold this strip in place. Now I can just rotate around to the next hole and so on. I've added a clamp there because I'm putting a clamp on either side of each hole as I drill just to make sure that neither of the two pieces move. And this setup worked fine to do all four of these little rivet holes. I'm almost ready to solder the strip in place now, but I got to refine the fit here a little bit. I've learned the hard way with these soldered and riveted joints that the rivets need to be a pretty easy sliding fit in there or you won't be able to assemble it once everything's all fluxed and stuff. What really helps here is putting a reamer in a pin vise and just kind of reaming out those holes a little bit to make sure that the rivets are a nice easy drop-in fit. They should slide back and forth easily in the holes there. That ensures that everything will go together nicely and that solder will fully encase those rivets. Very important now is to put a generous countersink on each of these rivet holes. This is so that the rivet has somewhere to expand into when we peen them over, and then you can file the area flat and there will still be material spanning beyond the scope of the hole on each side. It's not just friction that holds the rivet in there, it's actually material expanded on both sides. On to the worst part now, which is fluxing everything and putting the rivets in while everything is fluxed. There's no way to stay clean doing this. Everything will get covered in flux because, well, everything's covered in flux, including you and all your tools and the workbench. There's flux everywhere. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and cut all these rivets short now using my rivet cutting jig fixture tool thing that I made in a previous video. For the actual riveting, I busted out this riveting structure fixture thing that I made for the seam on the boiler shell. However, I immediately realized that wasn't going to work because the steam feed pipe is inside there now. So instead, I took a little piece of quarter inch square bar, put a dimple in it to act as a riveting dolly and I clamped it to the square bar and clamped the square bar to my vise jaws so that they don't move under hammering. This allowed me to hold the shell over the edge of this makeshift dolly, as you see here, and peen the rivets home. This was a quick and dirty setup, but it worked just fine. With that messy process behind me, it's over to the hearth now for the soldering. I'll touch up all of my flux here, make sure everything's going to be nice and clean, and get some little pieces of solder in there and get with the heating. This is a pretty straightforward joint. I'm just heating the shell below the joint, keeping the torch off of the solder itself, and just heating the shell, because 90% of the mass here is in the shell. So by heating the shell, the heat is going to conduct upwards into that strip, and the whole joint will get hot enough to melt the solder without the torch ever needing to touch those joints. Normally you want to heat a joint from the back, the opposite side of the solder, but it's hard to do that here because it's right at the top of the shell. You can't really do that without the flame accidentally heating the solder and melting it prematurely. This is the technique that Kozo describes for this joint, and it works great. Once again, of course, using the scratch rod to make sure that solder propagates all the way around and makes a nice seam. I also took a moment and caulked the rivets there just to make sure that they're all covered. Then into the pickle bath it goes, and I finished cleaning up the joint for inspection. 
I find that a needle or a pin helps get all of the soot off of there. It can be difficult to distinguish soot from porosity in the joint, so you got to get it clean here to inspect it. But that joint looks really good, so we can move on. All right, time for the outer crown sheet itself. This is quite a challenging piece to make, but the start of it is easy. I just cut a piece out of the copper material here to the dimensions given in the book. Same old routine here, rough cut on the bandsaw, and then I'm going to set it up to machine the edges nice and smooth and square over on the mill. I'm using a familiar setup here that you've seen earlier in this series, namely using my little fixture plate with one of my patented sheet metal clamping bars on top. I squared it up roughly using one of the two edges of the plate there, but both edges are going to get machined anyway, so it doesn't matter too much. I just want to make sure that I'm going to get a good cleanup without getting behind my dimension here. Quick pass down one side, and then I flip it around and do the other side the same way, making sure that my edges stayed parallel there. To set up the second edge, because that first edge is now machined, I used the pins that come with this fixture plate and a parallel to space it off a bit, and that got it nice and parallel to the mill table for me. Then I flipped it 90 degrees and did the same thing to square up the other two short edges there. Now with this piece of material squared up nicely and on dimension, I scribed a center line and the bending lines as indicated in the book here. So the center line, of course, is for alignment with the shell, and then the bending lines tell us where to bend the sides down for the sides of the bottom of the mushroom shape that this thing has. I decided to do the bends first, and I'm going to try using my little bending brake here for that. I decided to try uh, doing it unannealed first. I wasn't sure if my bending brake was up to this. And the answer is no, it was definitely not. Even though it's just copper, this material is pretty thick. So I went over and annealed it and tried again, and this worked just fine. I'm easing that down and measuring as I go. The book gives an angle of 30 degrees for this bend. And of course, with this style of bending brake, it bends both sides of the material the same amount. So you got to go half that amount on your bend. I'm also checking against the back head here. I'm trying to get the upper piece there to be roughly tangent to the curve at that point there. That looks pretty good. So I went and did the same thing on the other side, roughly the same amount there. This doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to be massaging this piece quite a bit before we're done anyway, but this gets us off to a good start. Now to do the curved part, I decided to use my slip roll for this. The nice thing about a slip roll is that you can do a curve in the middle of a piece like this that already has features on it, which is perfect for this scenario. I got my drive roller set and I got the material squared up to the machine there, and then I started adding tension to the bending roller on the back there. I went very gradually here. The number one mistake that I usually make with the slip roll is going too far. So I'm just trying to make sure I don't do that. Going a little bit at a time, not in a hurry, just gradually increasing that curve. Everything was going great, right up until this last move right here, where I had put a little too much tension on that roller, and all of a sudden I'm quite a bit over curved here. You can also see that the curve is asymmetrical. And that's because the sheet metal cover on the back of the slip roller got in the way and I wasn't able to roll as far on one side as the other. I should have been flipping the part around between passes probably, but well, we're going to have to do some manipulation here anyway. So I brought it over to the bench and because it's just annealed copper, you can kind of woman handle it pretty easily. And I was able to use the back head former to kind of get it into the ballpark here of the shape. I taped some extra material to the sides of the back head former because this former is actually a little smaller than this crown sheet needs to be because of course it accounts for the thickness of the back head material. So with that thickness added then I could use some clamps to squish the sides into position. With annealed copper this kind of thing is pretty easy to do because again there's virtually no spring back to annealed copper. You can pretty much just squish it up against the thing that you want it to be the shape of and it'll be the shape of that thing. To tune up the round section then I used the front tube sheet backer which is actually the same diameter as this part requires around the top. And I just did a little bit of hammer forming here to tune up the shape of this the same way that we did originally with the boiler shell. I worked that backer down and then I did a little bit of kind of hammer and dolly work in the corners there to tune them up a little bit, get those edges nice and clean there. I'm checking on the back head as I go to make sure that I'm getting a good fit. And that is looking pretty good right there. So I think we're ready to move on. 
I'm going to test fit all the pieces together now. This step is really important and I should have been a little more careful as you'll see with this step. Got the outer crown sheet on the shell there and I fit the throat plate in there. And I decided I didn't like the look of that throat plate joint. It's not as good as I kind of previously thought it was. I thought that joint was very good. It's not really now that I see it all together. So I did some more hammer forming again using the tube sheet backer, which has the same diameter as this throat plate requires. And I actually annealed that throat plate again and did a bunch more forming on it to try and tighten up the clearances there. Next, I have to trim the outer crown sheet to length. It's made intentionally oversized so that you can trim it after the fact. So I marked on the throat plate and the back head where it needs to be trimmed. There wasn't quite enough material here to bust out the saw or the mill or other fancy methods, so I just went ahead and used the file. It was a lot of filing though. A belt sander might have worked here, but I don't have one. You know what would have been the perfect tool for this though? A die filer. Hmm. Yeah, that's... It's not working at all. I guess I didn't build it right? I don't know. What's all the hype about these things? It doesn't seem to work at all. One more check here on all my dimensions to make sure these pieces are going to fit together okay, at least lengthwise there after that filing. Crown sheet goes on there, align my marks, and then the throat plate goes in there, and then the back head is going to go in the top there. And everything looks like it's going to line up nicely there. So I think I'm ready to move on. Now these next few steps are really crucial, but for the moment, let's admire the outer crown sheet there. That was a pretty tricky part to make, not gonna lie, but I'm happy with how that came out. I was having second thoughts about some of those throat plate joints, and I clamped it up and just took another look at it. And I thought, well, I think it's okay. I wasn't sure. I decided to leave it and give it a shot, but I really should have listened to that voice telling me this wasn't quite good enough. More on this in a minute. But first I need to make more holes, and these are for a couple of bushings that go in this part. So you can see the setup I'm using here, which is rather complex, but this is what I came up with. I've got machinist jacks to hold everything in place, and I got the angle plate set up on the vise. I'm lightly clamping the shell to that because it really needs rigidity in that dimension to keep from vibrating under drilling. And then I've got a machinist jack inside there supporting the shell from underneath so that the drill doesn't squish it under the downward force of drilling. This all seemed to be enough to drill a nice pilot hole right in the center here for the steam manifold bushing. I've got plenty of depth below the hole here, so this is a good use case for step bits. People are always telling me I should use step bits more, and well, the issue with them is that you have to have a lot of space below them, because to get to the diameter that you need, you have to go very deep. And most of the time in my setups on these parts, I don't have space below the hole. In this case, however, I do. Now the other thing to know about step bits is they do tend to cut oversized, just like drills do. So after making that hole, I went ahead and measured it to see what size the bushing is going to need to be and made a note of that. Sure enough, it's about a thou oversize. That's pretty typical for a step bit, but that's okay. I can just make the bushing to fit. Next up, I need a small bushing on the side right at the bottom. This is the blowdown bushing. This is what you use to drain and flush out the boiler to get rid of sediment and such. Once again, an excessively elaborate setup for this. I should have just clamped the top part of it to a block of wood and been done with it, but you know, hindsight and all that. Before I drilled this, I put a gauge pin in the diameter of the hole and I didn't like what I saw. This is very, very close to the bottom edge of that, as you can clearly see through this transparent gauge pin here. Kozo has more confidence than I do in drilling and threading, not blowing out a thin piece of material on the bottom edge of a hole. And I really wasn't confident that this was going to work, so I moved this hole up 25 thousandths. I don't think I'll regret that. It might be a little bit harder to fully drain the boiler dry, but this guaranteed that I didn't blow out the bottom of the hole and ruin this whole part that I've got a lot of hours into at this point. Then of course it's over to the bronze round bar to make those bushings. I'm just going to zip through this because you've seen me make a boiler bushings a million times by now, and there's really nothing interesting about these. Except that these are pretty close to the last ones actually on this boiler. There's the blowdown bushing there, the little one at the bottom, and the manifold bushing at the top. Then it's over to the silver soldering station to solder those in. These are both very easy joints, nothing fancy here. 
The steam manifold bushing, if you're wondering, is a secondary steam supply different from the steam dome. It's used for things that don't need good quality steam. So the whistle attaches here and the pressure gauge and things like that. Basically things where it's not worth plumbing them into the steam dome. The steam dome produces the driest and best quality steam and that's devoted just to feeding the cylinders. The usual pickling and inspection follows, of course. If the joints aren't perfect, you gotta fix them at this stage while it's still easy to do. But those both look really good. The next job is to get a whole bunch of fixturing screws all the way around this assembly here. I'm using a similar setup as I did for drilling the rivet holes, but this time I'm using V-blocks underneath there instead of the vise, because it's easier to work with the crown sheet assembly this way. I centered up on the seam, and then I'm very carefully drilling and tapping tiny little 164 threaded holes around this joint here for little tiny brass fixturing screws. These are to hold everything together during silver soldering. The drawings specify seven of these screws in various strategic places around the joint. And this same setup here worked pretty well to reach all seven of these holes. This was a pretty slow and tedious process, but you got to really take your time with this to keep from breaking any tiny taps or tiny drills or tiny screws. There's a couple of screws around the shell there. There's one in the center of the bottom of the throat plate there, and then there's two down each side of the throat plate. And then the upper two screws on the throat plate sides there serve an additional purpose, which you'll see here in a moment. Now I can take the clamps off because the screws are holding everything together. And this is the moment where your joint clearances better all be good because it's kind of too late to fix them. And mine are okay, they're not great. This throat plate joint here is not perfect. You can see some daylight there that shouldn't be there. You might be wondering about these little corners here where there's daylight, and that is not a problem. That's by design because Kozo specifies these funky little Y pieces that go in here to fill that area. There are no drawings for these pieces, so I'm just gonna have to wing it here. I've got a piece of cardstock, and I'm going to template this out and make these by hand. But you can see the idea here. There's one leg of the Y that folds down onto the throat sheet, and one that follows the curve of the shell and kind of ties everything together. So that's what we need to make out of copper. These parts are so small and they require hand fitting anyway, so I gave the machine tools a break here, and I used the fret saw and files to bring these guys to shape. You know you're a real model engineer when the fret saw comes out, or jeweler saw, or whatever else you want to call this. People have different names for stuff all over the world. There's the final little piece there. Now it gets annealed so that I can work it into the final shape that we need. I'm just working it by hand and with some pliers here and basically trying to mold it into that little space there so that one leg molds down and fits with the side of the throat sheet and the other follows the curve of the shell. You can kind of see the rough idea of how this is supposed to work. And then the upper brass screw on each side threads into these little Y pieces to hold them in place for soldering. Now, these fits are not great and I really should have spent more time on these in fact, you can see they're not even covering the little daylight holes in the corners like they're supposed to. I want to pause here because this is probably the area where I made the biggest mistakes in this part of the process. I kind of lost sight of the purpose of these Y-shaped pieces as I was forming them. You can see that I focused mostly on trying to get a good fit on the ends of the pieces there down the sides and around the shell. And I lost sight of the fact that they're supposed to be covering those little inner corners there. If I hadn't lost sight of that, I would have realized the real problem here, which is that the rivet ring that joins up with these pieces is still too long. There isn't enough clearance there for the Y pieces to bend down at the correct angle to cover that little corner area. But having lost sight of their true purpose, I decided these pieces fit just fine, and I moved on. I also should have spent more time at this stage fitting the throat plate. You can see little daylight gaps there, and there really shouldn't be there. But at this point, it was kind of too late because the brass screws had already been tapped, and if I tried to reshape things now, the threaded holes weren't going to line up anymore, and it was going to be a mess. So I left that part alone and just decided to press on. This is not my favorite aspect of the design of the spoiler. I'm not really sure what the role of these Y pieces is. I think the little triangle area there could have been eliminated much easier just by leaving the throat plate a little taller and fitting it with a little bit of filing. My pieces almost fit that way already. I filed them down because the drawing says to do so. If I hadn't done that, they would have fit tightly without the Y pieces. Maybe these Y pieces add some structural strength to it, so that could be why. 
In any case, I'm not a boiler designer, so I proceeded to build it to the drawings. I used my scriber to transfer the holes for the screws, and I took it over to the mill and drilled it out by holding it in my little toolmaker's vise here. And now you can see how that brass screw at the top threads through all three pieces here to hold everything together. I did at least have the foresight to see that those gaps around the Y pieces were going to be trouble, so I decided to cut some pieces of copper rivet down and stick them in there to act as kind of filler rod. Silver solder is really bad at filling gaps, so if I can fill the bulk of that space with some pieces of copper, then the silver solder can mold it all together kind of thing. Now everything gets pickled, including all the brass screws and my little pieces of filler rod and all the boiler parts. Everything gets pickled. It's all got to be pickled and fluxed if you're going to solder it. Now I can set it up in my hearth and start the fluxing and assembly process. I'm adding flux to each screw as I thread it in and making sure there's flux between all the surfaces. And I put solder on all the joints. I'm using full length pieces of solder here. I'm not taking any chances. I'm putting lots and lots of solder everywhere to make sure that everything is going to get filled nicely. I'm also using the cadmium based silver solder here that I talked about in the previous video. This stuff does not fill joints as well as the Harris Safety Seal 56 does, so I made sure to use extra for that reason as well. I considered using the Harris for this joint because I knew I had some gaps to fill, but the Harris is difficult to get to flow on really large joints like this, so I was worried I wasn't going to be able to flow it nicely. Then pickle and inspection. The news is pretty good. The main outer seam there looks excellent. I got a really good fillet all the way around there, and most of the screws have soldered through them, though not all of them. I'll need some touch-ups there. Inside, that seam also looks really good. I've got a really clean, solid seam all the way around. Down on the throat sheet, though, things are not so good. The areas that I suspected would be trouble were in fact trouble, so I'm going to have to do some touch-ups in there. Same on the sides, I've got some seam there, but there's also some gaps that I need to fill, and some of the screws need filling, and some of the corners and such. I went back and I soldered the throat sheet from the other side, from the outside, and that did an excellent job of really tuning up all those joints. After one of those passes, I had very few issues left. Just a couple of the brass screws needed touch-up, and right in the corners there needed a little bit of touch-up. Now over on the inside though, things took quite a bit more work. These Y-shaped pieces needed quite a bit of filling. I did five or six more heatings just touching up those Y pieces. My copper filler rod did work really well, I'm glad I did that, but it took a lot of solder to fill those gaps. You can fill a gap with silver solder, it just takes a lot of heatings because you gotta add a little solder and then let it cool off, pickle it, flux it, add a little more, and so on. You can't build it up like you can with welder braids. You have to let each pass cure, if you will. When all was said and done though, after seven or eight total heatings and touch-up sessions, I was really happy with this joint. It's really solid looking all the way around. I can't find any gaps or suspect areas. Even these little three-point corner areas on the outside, everything looks really good. Now I can cut off the excess screws on the inside, and on the outside I can file those screw heads flat. And if you did your job right, when you file the screw heads off, you'll just be left with a little patch of silver solder there because the brass was totally encased in silver solder that flowed through the threads of the fixturing screw. There she is, outer crown sheet and throat plate all together as one assembly. I'm really happy with where this is at. The throat plate joint is not going to win any beauty contests. It may look like there's a gap there from the outside, but if you look in there, there is a complete seam. It's just that that edge is not very well fitted but the joint looks really solid all the way around and I'm pretty confident that's going to pass a pressure test. Won't know for sure until we do the pressure test, of course. Pressure tests have a way of making liars out of all of us, but I'm feeling pretty good about it, so we shall see. That was a big job, but it's a big milestone in the boiler. Essentially, the outer surface of the boiler is done. Now all we got to do is build the firebox inside. I think we're over the halfway point now on this boiler, which is super exciting. I want to thank you very much for joining me this far in this journey. I hope you'll continue with me. And thanks so much to my patrons for making all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.